How's it going everyone? As always, my name is Jimmy Champagne. This is Deck Ready, my channel all about the Steam Deck. In today's video, we've got four topics to cover. The first one is that the Steam Deck is on sale and I'm gonna tell you which one to buy. Second, we're gonna talk about how your Steam Deck is a PS4 and things are looking really good for the future. Third, we're gonna talk about Steam Families. There's a ton of info. I got the most relevant stuff that you're gonna wanna know. And finally, this tool for launchers on the Steam Deck just got a huge upgrade. All right, let's jump into the first news story here, which is that the Steam Deck is on sale until September 26th. This is just the LCD models. I would not expect the OLED models to go on sale until they're at least a year old. So maybe the Thanksgiving sale, maybe the Christmas sale. It's not the OLED models. It's just the LCD models. And we're talking numbers here, so just bear with me. I do my best, but it's like my Achilles heel is talking numbers. So I'm gonna just round up and do all that stuff. Just bear with me. So the 64 gigabyte model is dropping $100. Normally it's 400 bucks, $399.99. They're dropping it to $296, which is just annoying. Why didn't you just drop it to 300 bucks? Why are you working with percentages? Just use flat numbers, please, Val, please. Now, the biggest reason I would go with the 64 gigabyte over the 512 gigabyte is of course, modability. You can get a one terabyte SSD right now for around 70 or 80 bucks. And it's not like the one I bought, which is a used drive from a Surface device for $279. It's like a Corsair drive, a WD Black Drive, like reputable brands where you can go into Best Buy and grab these drives. You can get them for 70 or 80 bucks. And the reason you're gonna to wanna to do that instead of getting a 512 version and getting a one terabyte micro SD card is micro SD cards are around the same price as SSDs right now, but they're slower. So if you wanna install Windows on a partition, you're gonna to wanna to have an SSD instead of running it off of a micro SD card. And also games will load quicker. You'll get better frame times. You'll get better 1% lows on an SSD over a micro SD card. So if you're someone who doesn't really play a lot of indie games, you're playing stuff like Ghost of Tsushima or God of War, for example, you're going to want to put those games on an SSD instead of a micro SD card. And you can put the one terabyte drive in the 64 gigabyte model and then get an SD card and have two terabytes. Whereas if you get the 512 gigabyte model, get a one terabyte micro SD card, you only got 1.5 terabytes of storage, which, you know, is good, but it's not really great considering you have to download shaders. You have to download all your saves. If you work with Emudeck or install something like the Silent Hill to enhanced edition, your SSD is going to get filled up very quickly. So I personally would go with the cheaper model up front and then upgrade it with a drive. You can order them at the same time. And most likely the drive will get there before the Steam Deck because right now they're doing three to five business day shipping windows. So if you order it, you'll get it in three to five days. Still a big improvement over the two weeks it used to take, but yeah, you'll probably get the drive quicker. It'll be ready to go for when the Steam Deck arrives. My biggest recommendation always though, is even though the Steam Deck OLED is a little more expensive. If this is something you've been waffling on, like you know you're gonna use it, you're gonna take advantage of a big Steam library, it's worth saving a little bit longer and hoping that there's going to be a sale on the OLED, maybe buying one secondhand from Facebook Marketplace or eBay, or just buying it for full price from Valve so you get the manufacturer warranty because as someone who has both and spends a ton of time gaming on these things, like I have firsthand knowledge of both devices. I've spent hundreds of hours on the regular Steam Deck. I've spent hundreds of hours on the OLED, the advantages you get with the OLED are more than the screen. The frame times are better. The 1% lows are better. It gets a little bit of a performance bump and the biggest bump it gets is in battery. I never really feel like it doesn't have enough battery, but that was the Achilles heel of the original Steam Deck was how poor the battery life was. So if you're someone who gets annoyed when you have to plug in your DualSense after one gaming session on the PS5, you don't like having to keep a battery bank in your backpack at all times to keep your device charged, I think the Steam Deck OLED is 100% the way to go. And that's not a slight if you can't afford it or you don't feel like you're gonna use it, like get the device that feels right for you. But if you're someone like me who gets buyer's remorse, you know, like you go, okay, I'm getting into something new. I'm gonna go with the cheaper model and then eventually upgrade to the more expensive one. You end up loving that device and then you just spend more money in the long run by upgrading way quicker than you thought you would. I would just go for the OLED just because you'll save yourself a ton of grief in the future. And ultimately I think it works out where you'll spend less money, of course, but the big silver lining here for people who are going to get the LCD and think they want the OLED later or just don't like the LCD. You can sell Steam Decks, whether they're 64 gigabytes or 512 gigabytes on eBay for around 270 bucks. So if you get it, you don't like it, or if you get it and you want to upgrade to the OLED, you can flip it on eBay and make back uh, everything you spent minus $20. So that's a pretty good deal in the long run. And you know, just reading through the comments, anytime the Steam Deck goes on sale or I talk about hardware, the main question I get is if I buy a Steam Deck now, am I only going to 
end up using it for a year before they release the Steam Deck 2. I think you're safe for at least a couple of years. 2025 seems like the earliest that they'll release a Steam Deck 2, but I'd still bet that it'll come out in the midway point or later end of 2026. I'm going to talk about that in the video for the weekend more. But yeah, I think you're still safe spending $300 on the 64 gigabyte model and upgrading the SSD. And as someone who's gone through multiple Steam Decks, one of the coolest features is even if you're moving from the LCD to the OLED, you can actually take the SSD out of the Steam Deck that you have currently. And then when you get the OLED, you can put it in and you'll just have to do a quick update, but all the games you downloaded and all your saves will still be on that SSD, which is great. And then you can put the 64 gigabyte drive you originally had back in the LCD model and sell it. So it's really a win-win all around. But yeah, I hope that wasn't too confusing. I'm just really bad at talking about numbers. I would personally go for the 64 gigabyte model and upgrade the SSD or buy an OLED model because it's just that much better. I know people don't like hearing it because it's really expensive. And of course, money is hard to come by right now because of how expensive everything is, which sucks. But I think even with all of that context in mind, the OLED is still worth the extra money, especially if you've never bought a Steam Deck. Like upgrading, I could kind of see maybe not wanting to do that. But you know, if you've never bought a Steam Deck, just go for the best model because you're going to have the best experience. That's my personal opinion. I know some people feel differently and that's fine. Anyway, that brings us to the second news story here, which is that your Steam Deck is becoming a PS4 much quicker than anyone thought. Well, I kind of knew because I talked about this recently and I said it's probably going to move a lot quicker than everyone thinks. So the last time we talked about this, the main game that everyone's trying to get running on the new PS4 emulator is of course Bloodborne because despite the massive niche fan base that's been built up for that game, Sony has completely ignored it since it came out. They've never really patched it for the PS4 Pro. It runs with terrible frame pacing. It never really holds 30 FPS, whether you're playing it on a PS4, PS4 Pro, or PS5, it is in dire need of an upgrade. We've heard from the creator of Bloodborne that he really wants a PC version out there. We know there's a movie in the works from Sony, so maybe Sony's going to try and time it for that. But in the meantime, the main goal of emulator people is to try and get that game running excellently on PC. And of course, because the Steam Deck is a PC, any work they do to get it running on desktop PCs also translates to the Steam Deck. Now, the last time we talked about this, there were a lot of visual errors. There was no dialogue. You could get into the menu. You wouldn't see text, but it was close. Now the game is fully up and running on the Steam Deck and it's awesome. I watched a video from Deck Wizard where he got all the way to the end of the game and fought the Moon Presence, who is the last boss in Bloodborne, and it was holding a rock solid 30 FPS. All the textures were in place. All the graphical effects were in place. It looks really damn good on the Steam Deck and it's running phenomenally. The one issue it still has is that dialogue isn't in the game, but like I'd argue argue that dialogue does not really add all that much to Soulsborne games. I know there's a huge fan base out there that loves to just pick apart all the different like little teeny lines of dialogue and then extrapolate hours and hours of lore for YouTube videos from them. But I'd argue that the vast majority of people playing these games are there for the rock solid gameplay and the atmosphere and vibe of the world. And if you asked me as someone who's played every Souls game from From Software going all the way back to Demon Souls on PS3, I think out of all of them, Bloodborne has by far the best atmosphere. So knowing that, I don't think it really matters all that much that the dialogue is missing in the middle of boss fights. But with the progress that they made on this emulator in the first place, I wouldn't expect it to take very long at all for that dialogue to be restored. I personally haven't messed around with getting this up and running on my Steam Deck. I'm kind of the person who likes to wait until it's actually finished. I did the same thing with RCPS3 and the experience is very solid on either my gaming PC or the Steam Deck. So I'm going to give it a little bit longer of a wait, but this is a huge achievement. Seeing PS4 games that have been neglected by Sony up and running on the Steam Deck is just awesome. It's really cool at its base and I hope hope more work continues to be done on this because as we've seen, Sony is not the best when it comes to game preservation. I'm working on a video for PS Ready where I go into uh, the PS1 emulator, the PSP emulator, and the PS2 emulator that runs on the PS5. It's not a great experience. When you're playing games like Killzone Liberation that were rock solid, super well optimized, and had great graphics, it is a solid experience on the PS5 for sure. Like everything works as it should. But then when you move over to games that are a little bit rougher around 
around the edges like resistance retribution not only do they really show their age but the emulator is not really holding up to the test of time either sly cooper runs like terribly for some reason you get frame drops the frame pacing's all over the place the colors are super washed out no matter what filter you use uh, star wars the clone wars is a really bad experience it has insane frame drops the stretched images look terrible they did no work to upscale it at all the colors look super washed out i know tomb raider legends is like the worst offender uh in terms of you know running these games on the ps2 emulator but like i'm not paying 15 bucks for a game that i didn't really like when it came out just to test it out for a video i saw enough with star wars the clone wars so yeah knowing how terrible the experience is on the playstation 5 it shows the importance of having emulators for the ps3 ps4 ps2 psp and ps1 all ready to go on the steam deck and other gaming pc so i'm glad games like bloodborne are currently at a state where you can run them better than the ps4 and ps5 currently run them to this day anyway that brings us to the third news topic of today's video which is that steam families is available now you have to opt into a beta on steam to use it but that's very easy to do it's like a two-click process so if you want to figure out how to do that just head over to the steam families page and it explains the entire process it's super simple and you know this isn't like a brand new feature they had library sharing before but it was neglected for so long that i completely understand why instead of like iterating on it they just decided to burn it down and rebuild it from the ground up and i think they did a pretty good job so you can actually have six people in a steam family the leader and five other people and it's not limited to a household like a netflix subscription is which is great and the only big drawback is that there's a one-year cooldown on leaving a family or deleting a family so if you delete your family you have to wait a year before creating a new one or if you leave a family or are kicked out of one you have to wait a year before you can join another one and that you know i've seen criticism of it it makes sense to me uh if you have a bunch of friends who have big steam libraries but you know that one of them has a game that you want and another one has a game that you want you could abuse that system very easily by just bouncing between families and never paying for games and just from personal experience i'm a little bit burned so i'm siding with valve here not even corporate shilling like this happened to me i had a friend in college who was one of my best friends honestly when i met him and he was really cheap and i thought that was funny you know he wouldn't pay for anything he would stretch things as far as they could go and he told me about the steam library sharing feature so when he asked me i was like yeah there's a bunch of games that i'm not playing and he doesn't have any games because you know he doesn't have a lot of money i'll be nice and add them to my family then i'm pretty sure it was tomb raider 2013 when that came out i downloaded it on launch night and i saved up my money to get it and he had the gall to text me and say hey man i'm trying to play tomb raider can you get off of tomb raider so i can play it and i was like no i just spent 60 dollars on this i want to play it and he was arguing with me about being able to play it instead of me because he couldn't afford it and i was like you know what i'm removing this feature and it caused a massive falling out with my friendship and i am no longer friends with that person to this day so as someone who has been mooched off of and it didn't really go well i am fine with the cooldown period i just think like still with uh, with that happening to me one year is a little long they should move it down to six months or three months right like punish the people who are bouncing between libraries stop them from doing it a year cooldown just seems like a little egregious in my opinion at least the cool update that this got that i'm pretty sure wasn't possible in the last version of it is you can play different games from the family owner's library at the same time that the person is online so if i'm playing dead rising deluxe remaster and you want to play portal 2 on my account you're good it's just like if you want to play portal 2 on my account and i'm playing portal 2 on my account you won't be able to play it until i'm done playing it i think that's fair the person who spent the money on the game in the first place should be the one who gets to take advantage of the library at any given time i don't know though if you're able to boot family members off if you're the leader but i think that would be a good feature to add if it's not there because again if i bought the game i should be able to play it whenever i want and i should have power over the people who are mooching off of me you know it just seems fair i mentioned this earlier but you can kick people from your steam family and you can be kicked out of a steam family so if you're in a steam family be thankful and uh happy that your friend is being generous and allowing you to play their games and don't be an asshole like my friend from college and you won't get kicked from a steam family and then the other thing that you're going to have to keep in mind if you have a friend like that is that if there is someone who likes to cheat in online games like cs2 or call of duty for example those are two of the most prominent games that i think people cheat in not only will they be banned if they're playing your steam family game you will be banned as well so if you have a friend who likes to cheat in games and has fun doing that you might not want to add them to your family because if you get kicked from a game like cs2 you're going to have to make a new steam account just to play that game and that would really suck and then the final cool feature you get with steam families is that uh these games can be played offline 
whether you're the leader of the family or you're a family member, once you have Steam family sharing enabled and you have the game downloaded to your Steam Deck or a device that you wanna take offline, I'm sure there's a check-in grace period of probably like 30 days or so, but uh, yeah, you're able to play those games offline. And that brings us to the fourth news topic of today's video, which is this huge upgrade that non-Steam launchers has gotten. I love this software. Uh, it's a one-click script that you can install on the desktop side of Steam OS that basically installs every launcher under the sun. You can pick which ones it installs. I just left everything checked. So it'll install Epic Games, GOG, Ubisoft Plus, and Battle.net. And I think even a couple more of those, like if I didn't say Epic Games, it'll install that too. It'll do the button mapping for you. It'll map everything where the game should install exactly how you want it. And of course it does it all in one click. Now they've taken things one step further by allowing you to back up not only your Proton saves and settings, but also your game saves. So if you didn't know, if you're playing a game that you bought on Steam, Steam Cloud is enabled unless the developer tells it not to be. And the only games I've ever run into that with are e like uh, Need for Speed Hot Pursuit Remastered. They didn't have Steam Cloud in that game for the longest time and Burnout Paradise Remastered. They added it in at a later date. But if you were working with a game that didn't have Steam Cloud active, you could use this new feature that non-Steam launchers added to back up your saves to the cloud. So if you're bouncing between your gaming PC or get a new Steam Deck or have to send in your Steam Deck for RMA, those saves will never be lost. Epic Games, I'm pretty sure most of the games have cloud support, but I remember specifically at launch Dead Island 2 didn't and I got a new laptop and I had to do this whole process of like putting the save on a USB stick and then moving it over to the new laptops so that really sucked so in the case that games from other launchers don't have saves you'll be happy to know that your saves are safe and sound anyway guys that's all I've got for you in today's video as always my name is Jimmy Champagne I'll see you in the next one thanks for watching and shape on